When we left off the last time, we had finished the four trumpets of judgment and then we were about to engage the discussion of the last three trumpets of judgment beginning in Revelation 9. So we'll simply jump right in. It says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the green grass, or the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those, only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days men shall seek death and will not find it. They shall desire to die and death will flee from them. Now the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men, they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and they and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One of the past, one woe is past, Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Now, the, the, this, this point of demarcation between the four trumpets that precede and the four that succeed, that come after, there are certain things to be observed right away. In the preceding four, the circumstances that are released upon the earth have to do with the confusion of men ripening, coming to the place where the whole structure of, of man's thought and ways that, have, that has evolved historically from the Garden of Eden and the deception that took place there until it had reached this point of such ripeness that it is being judged. Those first four have to do with conditions largely resulting from the activities of mankind. The last three, however, of the seven trumpet judgments have the significant component of being demonically inspired, motivated, empowered, and, and uh, coming forth upon the earth with the fury of the demonic. Now we must understand, 
even at the threshold here, that Satan has to be given permission to do anything upon the earth. Now, once he secures permission, now there are two sources from which he may be given permission. One is mankind being deceived gives him permission, such as in the case of Adam and continuing. The second source is when God actually permits him and permits the opposition to man, the demonic opposition to the existence of man to have power. That form of power, when God permits it, in the Greek here is referred to as exousia, exousia. So it's in the nature of one doing the will of God, exercising. It's where we get the the English term executive from. So even in the doing of these things, it's not that the demonic has power to indiscriminately do whatever it wants to. You will note again and again it says, and power was given to them. Power was given to them. This form of power is not, is different. The, the, the first form that was exercised was the, the, as it were, the natural extensions of deception. This form of power requires permission. We've seen this before. In the book of Job, Satan comes before God and God asks him, what are you doing or where have you been? And he answered that he was walking up and down in the earth and going to and fro in it and God asks him, had he considered God's servant Job? And his response was, well of course I've considered him, he's faithful to you because you hedge him about. Give me power to torment him and I will will guarantee you that he will curse you. And God granted him permission, limiting the scope of what he could do. So it's very important to note that this has precedent in the Scriptures. You know, the way to interpret the book of Revelation is not by domesticating the language, not by um, taking the, the, the things that are spoken literally, but to understand that it is highly symbolic, but but the references that are concentrated in the book of Revelation are found elsewhere in the Scriptures in plain meaning. So we don't have to conjecture, we can simply allow the Scriptures to interpret the Scriptures. Needless to say, I'm sure you you would assume that in preparing these messages on the book of Revelation, I would have gone back to look at what commentators have said. And I'm thoroughly amused, really, about some of the the wild conjectures of people who were considered eminent biblical commentators. Certain commentators analogize events of the book of Revelation to the days of Napoleon. Uh, I was more amused by certain ones who analogized to uh, what they called, quote, the Mohammedans, unquote, and or the Saracens. Of course, this would, this would speak to a Eurocentric perspective rooted largely in the Crusades. So people have been attempting to understand and to interpret uh, and to write about uh, the the book of Revelation for a very long time. And it seems that the commentators cannot resist the urge to locate 
uh, the events of the book of Revelation to past historical times. And they do so in principal part because early in the book of Revelation, the first within the first three chapters, within the first chapter, and then continuing through three, three chapters, uh, John is told that when John encounters Jesus on the island of Patmos, the, the risen Christ actually, on the island of Patmos, he's told that he was about to, to be shown things that must, quote, shortly come to pass, shortly come to pass. And indeed, the first three chapters and the message to the seven churches of Asia are things that were, that did in fact shortly come to pass and largely relate to the early church in the days of the Roman Empire. But then they miss this verse that says, then I will show you, come up here and sit with me, chapter 4 verse 1, and I will show you things that are to come. Uh, and the, the, pre, the, the, the language is after this. So there's the first sequence of three chapters and then the, there's the after this. Now, in the after this, it speaks of the great themes of the scriptures that have been prophesied throughout the prophetic scriptures, such as the rise of a global kingdom that, quote, devours and tramples down the whole earth. Now, or an army that is described as one of 200 million people or 200 million soldiers. Uh, such an army has never been fielded in the history of mankind. But more to the point, it speaks of the final overcoming of the saints. At no point in history have these things been accomplished. They're like kind, they're like types and shadows have. It's always amusing and somewhat amazing to me that the, it is not obvious to biblical commentators on the book of Revelation, it is not obvious that there are cycles of the same thing running through history. But interestingly enough, they would say that in the Old Testament there are types and shadows of things that ultimately reach their fulfillments uh, in, in the New Testament, for example. But they never consider that there are things in the New Testament that are types and shadows as well, which function as placeholders until the things actually spoken about come to pass in their fullness. Now, but I don't want to go too far afield because we've done a lot of work in explaining surrounding facts uh, regarding uh, the book of Revelation and how it ought be interpreted. Now, it says, the, the fifth angel sounded and a star, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. Now, let's take that that bit. The word fallen, or first the word star is the, is the word aster, A-S-T-E-R, aster. And it relates to the word stronomi, S-T-R-O-N-N-U-M-I, stronomi. It's where we get the study of the stars as being astronomy. Now quite often, star has a double meaning, a double entente, actually a triple entente. It may mean either physical star 
one of the planets or one of the uh, one of the planets that we may see when we look up in the night sky clearly that is not meant here because if that falls out of the heavens and strikes the earth it's the end of all things but there is that meaning to the word aster but we in, even in our time We use the word star to describe people who stand out, like movie stars, like um, opera stars, like political stars, like stars at the at the at the bar, uh, if if you're a lawyer, or um, stars in business in the business world, people who are luminous. We get the term luminary from that. So it may also refer to a human being. But in this case, it refers to something else. And there's a spiritual meaning to the word star, such as is found in the book of Jude, that describes wandering stars for whom are reserved the blackness of darkness forever. This tends to refer to the demonic, the demonic. Now, when you think of how this star behaves and what happens in regards to this star, the third meaning is the only possible meaning. In other words, this star fell from heaven to earth and he was given the key to the bottomless pit. Clearly not a human being, clearly not one of the luminous bodies in the heavens, but a demonic spirit. Further to that is the term fallen. A star had fallen from heaven to earth. There the word for fallen is the word pipto, P-I-P, T-O, pipto, and it's different from the word, another word for fallen, which is the word apostasy, apostasia. So this is not a reference to an apostate, someone who's fallen away from the truth, but someone who actually has been removed from his high position and here we're talking about a demonic spirit who has been removed from a high position. Further, the term fallen is more related to the fact that it had fallen already as opposed to suddenly and precipitously being expelled from heaven. Let me also point out that there are three heavens. So when we speak of a star falling from heaven, it's also important that we understand what heaven is being referenced here. The word Uranus refers to heaven, but there are three of those. There's the highest heavens or the heavens of God, when Paul said, I know a man, 14, Paul said, I know a man 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. And he speaks of himself in an out of body experience being caught up to the third heaven, which is the dwelling place of God. Not unlike John in the, in the book of Revelation, who says, I heard a voice saying, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 that says, suddenly there was a door standing open before me into heaven and I heard a voice saying, come up here and sit with me and I will show you that which is yet to come. And then he said, suddenly I was in the Spirit. Uh, And indeed he was not only in the Spirit but he was before the throne of God. So there is the third heaven. Now, 
Paul also speaks in the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, he speaks of spiritual forces of evil, so they're spiritual as opposed to natural or human, they're forces or powers of evil in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle, he said, against flesh and blood, but we wrestle again. So, so he's describing these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places as not flesh and blood. That would be humans. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, so there are three heavens. The evil ones, the fallen angels, have been removed from the heavens a long time ago, perhaps contemporaneous with uh, the arrival of Adam and Eve upon the earth because Satan comes into the garden shortly after the record of the creation of Adam and Eve. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were on the earth uh, in their unfallen states, but we do know that while they were in fact, before they had children, we know that uh, Satan appeared in the garden. So we know there are three heavens, the highest heavens being the heavens of God, the middle, if you would allow me to use that term, the middle heavens, which is uh, the, the location of the spiritual forces of evil, and the heavens surrounding the earth, the ones that would contain the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now here's a very, here is insight. So a star fallen from heaven to earth. So what he's saying is that out of the place where they had already fallen, a particular demonic figure was put, was evicted or had actually been placed out of that realm into the earth. We do know that such things are, uh, had already occurred, as they were, as if they were persons in uh, beings in waiting. We would later, in the same ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, we'd later see that there were uh, angels, four great angels who were bound by the great river Euphrates, fallen angels in a condition of restraint in Babylon, the great river Euphrates. So we know that some of these creatures have already been cast down and are operational in the earth. In addition to that, we certainly know of such demonic figures as the prince of Persia, who was not so much in the second heavens as he was establishing rule over the ancient kingdom of Persia. And a a contemporary was also called the Prince of Greece, this from the book of Daniel, uh, the, the ninth chapter. So this star, this fallen spirit, had already been in the earth and was given, now he was given the key to the bottomless pit. Let's look into this, the bottomless pit. it It is frequently referred to as also the abyss. Bottomless is simply the term boundless which means that it's without, it's, it's an unfathomable, an unfathomable depth. We run into this concept in the book of Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 31, in which 
uh, the demoniac from the country of Gadara, who was a man, of course, possessed of demons, who said, the demon said, that is, to Jesus, have you come here to torment us before the time? And begged Jesus not to send them to the abyss, to the bottomless pit. Now in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the, the scriptures say, For if God spared not the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. That is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And the word used there for hell is the word tartarus from the verb tartaru, which is to cast down to hell. It signifies being consigned to Tartarus, which by the way is neither Sheol, which is a common translation for the term grave, or Hades, uh, or the word Gehenna, which are common references to hell that contain humans. But it's a special place, it would seem, one where the spirits are reserved unto judgment. This region is similarly described as pits of darkness. So, you've got another place, it's, it's actually called the lowest region or the nether region and it distinguishes the place of humans, the containment of human souls after their deaths from the entrapment of demonic spirits who are in Tartarus or the abyss or the bottomless pit. So what we have in these few verses, when the fifth angel sounded, an angel who had already fallen, a demonic spirit that is, who had already fallen out of the second heaven was given a key to Tartarus, which is the place of the entrapment and containment of demonic spirits. And he opened the bottomless pit. And that's where we'll continue when we come back. I hope you'll continue to join me. You see, the Bible actually can and does interpret itself. 